Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are uh, at the third and last uh, panel on uh, uh, science, engineering, and technology integrated and in, in strategic uh, perspective. And then uh, uh, before uh, going to present our distinguished panelists, I needed to propagate to more World Academy current initiatives to promote science, engineering, and technology by an integrated and strategic perspective. And uh, the, those initiatives are just one. The first one is uh, The first one is uh, in cooperation with IEEE, the, uh, with the um, uh, System Man and Cybernetics uh, uh, IEEE uh, uh, group. And then uh, um, World Academy was, is organizing two special sessions, uh, uh, one special session in cybernetics uh, titled Hybrid Reality, and the second special session uh, that, uh, in the human machine system area uh, titled Mixed Reality, Symbiotic System Science and Digital Twin. And um, the deadline uh, for paper submission is just the end of June. So we have uh, still time to prepare some good, uh, good paper to, to submit there. The second, the second one is uh, just a special issue on sensors uh, on, on MD, uh, DPI platform that hopefully you know, that is uh, a very well renowned uh, uh, platform for open, open publishing. That uh, special issues titled Humanity and System Science Towards Symbiotic and Autonomous Artificial Intelligence. And this issue uh, as an open, an open framework of about one year, uh, because the uh, deadline for manuscript submission will be the 1st of June of, two, of, two, of uh, uh, 2021. And so, uh, uh, again, uh, you, know, you know that uh, World Academy is promoting uh, a lot of, uh, of thinking about combining uh, the human components with, uh, with the science, engineering, and technology. And this is a, a, a good opportunity to publish your article because uh, in this in this way uh, this platform uh, just uh, waive the usual charging fee that for this this journal is about two thousand Swiss francs and so it's just up to you to you know to take advantage of this opportunity okay and now we we can go. We can go back to our panelists, and uh, I invite uh, each one of them uh, to present uh, himself or herself with uh, a short uh, the description of their affiliation and their main interest. And we start with uh, uh, Carlos, uh, please. Yes, good evening. Uh, I am Carlos Alvarez Pereira. I'm a fellow of WAS, of the World Academy of Art and Science, and member of the executive committee of the Club of Rome and the club together with my colleagues Mampela Rampele and Petra Kunkel, I coordinate uh, our initiative on emerging new civilizations. Since some years now I've, I've been uh, working and personally involved in research on the reframing of uh, science, innovation and technology for the purpose of sustainable well-being on which I will, I will uh, talk uh, later in more detail. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. So Michael, it's your turn now, please. Uh, my, yeah, I'm Michael Smith. I'm a chair of the uh, board of uh, VAXA Inc. I'm also associate uh, fellow of BLAST and I'm also AI uh, senior brain initiative. And my interest is in what do we really mean by uh, the post-COVID new world and how this will affect the future of developments in science technologies. Thank you, Michael. Toy, it's your turn now. Please. Uh, please unmute, unmute, unmute yourself. Yeah. Okay. So I'm Toy Massey and uh, good morning. I am a um, nuclear engineer and physicist. I am affiliated with the National Advisory Council of Global Minded. I'm a leader on the STEM team for that organization. 
I am also founder and CEO of the Jekyll Foundation, J-E-K-L Foundation for STEM Education, whose mission it is to embrace the uninitiated child or youth and change the face of technology forever. Thank you, Toy. Jonathan, please, it's your turn. My name is Jonathan Blackwood. I did my undergrad at uh, the Massachusetts Institute of ne Technology. I completed medical school at the University of Pittsburgh and became a medical doctor. And after seeing a lot of opportunity to improve both the education and healthcare system through innovation and the use of technology, I directed my efforts and creativity toward pursuing my passion in entrepreneurship and helping people solve very difficult problems. Um, some of the companies I've had the pleasure and opportunity to work with include Global Minded, uh, one class, lead by example, and in the future, uh, the way that I see the world, I will be de delivering my impact if I can increase the access to education and healthcare and improve the delivery of those two things as well. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you, Jonathan. Patricia, please. Um, my name is uh, Patty Lopez. I am affiliated with the Global Minded uh, International Advisory Council, and I'm a senior platform uh, application engineer at Intel, uh, working in the data center group. Uh, my interests uh, over the past 20 years have spanned uh, K through 12 education, inclusion, organizational culture, and my passion is around changing access uh, to uh, technology and education across the globe um, and enabling not had the opportunity to access education to be able to participate in the world of technology. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, so now I, I introduce the, the team uh, of, the, of the panel. And uh, we, I start with the, 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 the coronavirus has not broken our world. It just exposed the world that was already breaking. The mm. ultimate problem we face today is not coronavirus or deadly pathogens or any other single threat. It is our inability to solve most of the sheer existential challenges we face. The mental tendency of dividing reality into contrary uh, and polar opposites by dichotomizations results in a continual clash between mutually exclusive contradictions that resolve into complementaries at a higher level. And so, human life cannot be only understood in terms of generalization and statistics. We need to take into account the role of a conscious individuality in human affairs. Human accomplishment is the product of subconsciousizations, uh, conscious perceptions, and forces that are influenced by past events, present perceptions, and future possibilities. The reunification of these three dimensions of time into a triple time vision will mark an important contribution to the emergence of the new anthropic scientific method. So we are living right now a transition from the classic scientific method to the new anthropic scientific method. And uh, I like to to just uh, uh, show you a little a little uh, slide to uh, refer so they, they, you see this red path. This red path is the usual path we are we were uh, educated to uh, by the scientific the traditional scientific method uh, by the reductionist approach uh, based on a, on the Newtonian philosophy and then uh, and then uh, a, a, an approach that uh, uh, by definition excluded any human component and now today we have a new track the yellow one. That is the track that uh, is coming from uh, uh, quantum uh, theory, quantum field theory, that uh, take, take, is taking into consideration the human component. Mm -hmm. And so 
now we have to learn how to use this uh, additional component for the, bene the, uh, the benefit of the common well-being. And uh, the, uh, the red track emphasizes just the, uh, the unique genius, unique gen scientific genius. The yellow track emphasizes the collaborative approach, the uh, collective intelligence and the collaborative innovation. And so this opened up an, a, a completely new universe. And when you hear to, uh, talking about resilience, then immediately you have to switch to the yellow path because the yellow path is the only one that is able to guarantee you a, a resilience modeling framework that has to take into consideration a multi-scale representation of systems to build uh, resilience. But that's just the beginning because we need something even better to, to arrive to anti-fragile systems. The, or, uh, in the sense that uh, uh, with anti-fragility, uh, Nassim Taleb defined systems that are able to thrive from any perturbation, any uh, unexpected perturbation. And see uh, that uh, in this kind of a framework, you see that the, the eight pattern there that is just a two-dimensional representation of something that is really three-dimensional, like here. And you see the three basic uh, variables for the three-dimensional representation that are potential, uh, connect, co connectedness, and resilience. And so you see that to build resilience, connectedness is, is fundamental. And connectedness, connectedness means co collaborative. Uh, uh, in a collaborative work. And, the, and this is the basic reference I want to put on the table to start our discussion. And I like to start with uh, Michael Smith because uh, uh, I think that uh, he has uh, a unique uh, perspective to offer to all of us. Please, Michael, go ahead. Thank you, Rodolfo. Well, yes, I know that many, I agree with many issues facing the world today and the future development of science, engineering, technology, which I can't talk at all about them. I want to focus on one basic one. What do we mean by the COVID-19 new normal? And what implications does it have for the future development of science and engineering? So what I'd like to uh, start with, we hear new normal a lot, but what does it really mean? Once we understand it, we can better use our collective intelligence and collaborative innovation design utilize system engineering technology to implement and support this new normal. As mentioned yesterday, design and engineering technology is cool. However, how and why we use them is what is important. I'm a survivor of two major cancers, tongue and colon. I've been living a new normal life for several years now. New normal for cancer patients have similarities to the post-COVID-19 new normal. For example, with cancer, doctors will tell a patient they will now be living in normal a life that ought to be quite different than it was before cancer. And this is hard for people who do not have cancer understand it. But this is also true for people living in a post-COVID-19 world. While some may think life will go back to normal as it was before, if and when a vaccine is found, this may not be true, as we do not yet know how effectively any vaccine may be, or if it will immunize some people, leaving the elderly or those underlying medical conditions at risk like they are today with the flu, pneumonia, COVID-19, and other diseases. And of course, we all recognize that the risk of new pandemics in the future is much higher than before. Hence, some change behaviors, attitudes, values, and reaction to the post-COVID new normal may be with us for a long time, even after a COVID-19 vaccine is found. So what are the, some of these new change behaviors, attitudes, values, and reactions we can expect to see in the future? Well, cancer patients live without fear of the disease recurring any time. This is also true of COVID-19 and any new unknown pandemic. Cancer patients are immunocompromised. Hence, they have to always watch out for sick people. They practice mitigation risk daily. Same is true for the post-COVID-19 world, especially people who are elderly who have underlying medical conditions. Cancer patients look at life differently. Same is also true for people in the post-COVID new normal. Everyone's perspective in their life changes. Many of the values change. 
people's attitudes change about their job. Is it important? Is it essential or non-essential? Is it time to retire, work at home? Both cancer patients and people living in a post-COVID-19 new normal world respond to the new normal differently. Some rational, some not. Think what happened to toilet paper. Both may have physical, emotional, and psychological stars. Once we understand these emotional and psychological changes in people that motivates and drives their actions, behaviors in the new normal of today and the future, we can better design and utilize science, engineering, technology to help implement and support this new normal. However, not everyone's new normal will be the same. We will be dealing with people's perception of the new normal, not with reality. A refugee coming from the Middle East will have quite a different perception of what new normal means to them than to someone else living in Paris or New York. This is what would be a challenge for science, engineering, technology today in the future. Previous assumptions have to be put aside as we are facing a once in a generation shift that happened suddenly and rapidly. If we want to improve the common well being, we have to incorporate into our model of collective intelligence and collaborative innovation people's perceptions of the new normal and what each of them really desires and needs. To do this, to do this we have to also incorporate multiculturalism and diversity in order to understand the different perceptions of people around the world to the same physical facts. Also, as discussed in yesterday's panel, we have to understand, include, and better the lives of those who are suffering from economic diversity whose standard of living is far less than ours. However, there are some common desires and needs in the post-COVID-19 new normal just like the cancer patient. They include more social distancing, mitigation risk, more working at home or remotely, online education training, and most importantly, a greater need for a global telehealth network, perhaps when using AI and a network of telehealth doctors located around the world. As these can be seen, these all require the support of a functional global internet network. However, as Dr. Trackfish mentioned yesterday, there's a great digital divide in the world, especially among the rich and the poor, those in the city and those in rural areas. For many, even they have the internet, is of low bandwidth, expensive, and hence of limited use. As mentioned yesterday, according to reports recently published, only 59% of the world has access to the internet. Only 45% of people in the world have smartphones. Another 16% have mobile feature phones that are only capable of very basic internet service. So we have a need for the new normal to develop global internet with high bandwidth for all. The question is how? One solution providing universal internet service that is provided everywhere is the development of global low earth satellite networks. Theoretically, with such a network, we could reach everyone on earth cheaply and with enough bandwidth to satisfy the need. Today, there are a number of companies building or planning to build such networks. One such company is starting. To date, they have launched 538 operational broadband internet satellites in orbit. They plan to open their satellite internet service two years later this year. Next year, they'll start expanding to the rest of the world. Their service will offer high bandwidth and cost around $100, $300 to buy the satellite receiver to pick up the internet signals. Internet service itself will be around $80 a month, U.S. The receiver is the size of a pizza box, makes it portable, which will be very useful in third world countries where it can be shared by an entire village. These are costs avoidable in the developed world, but we require to be heavily subsidized by government or private funding in third world countries. But costs expect to go down with economy of scale. Very importantly, using such a global satellite network to provide global internet service will allow data to be stored, processed, and protected while following laws of ethics and privacy. Now, this global internet network will allow and enable new developments in many applications of science technologies, thus resulting in social distancing made easy and practical and realistic worldwide, expanding working at home or remotely anywhere in the world, online education training via universities around the world, and most importantly, developing a global telenet internet that help people both in developed and third world companies. For example, a global telenet internet network may use AI or other smart expert system, longer telenet health doctors locally around the world to diagnose and treat cancer and other serious diseases, provide personalized medicine, and fulfill other health needs globally. Smart watches and smartphones with Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and expanded sensors may be used to monitor patients remotely as needed. This will enable people in poor rural areas who today receive either no care or best minimal and substandard care 
to get appropriate care, live long and healthier lives, enable them to function better and contribute more to their own society. The telehealth network allows to allow for early detection and treatment of new waves of COVID-19 or other future pandemics, thus saving lives. Hence, there is and will be an important role for collective intelligence collaborative innovation for developing new science engineering technology to improve the future common well-being of massive numbers of people around the world who today receive little or no health care. But we have to understand what people mean when they talk and live the new normal. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mike. Well, I think that you put on the stage uh, uh, many, many different issues uh, that uh, <laughs> I think that we will we, we'll not have enough, enough time to discuss all of them in, in this panel. But uh, I think that uh, each one of you can pick up with the, the, the issue that uh, like, like best and, uh, and then try to, to give an answer. So, Carlos, so you, you like to start first, please? Yeah, grazie, Rodolfo. So let me share with you some ideas provoked by the, among other things, by the title of our session, and in particular, those words of collaborative innovation for common well-being. And starting by saying that uh, we live in a, humanity lives in a huge contradiction. We are thriving and committing suicide at the same time. We actually said that, we, the Club of Rome, I mean, actually said that 50 years ago, but now it is really happening. Yes. So on one side, if you want a life expectancy, levels of education, literacy, uh, emancipation of women, higher material well-being, and of course, the progress of science, uh, humanity is thriving. But uh, if you look at the um, growth in uh, social inequalities, climate warming, biodiversity loss, etc. cetera, uh, humanity is at the same time committing suicide. How, how could it be possible? Because uh, what we have now has been built on the best of ourselves. I mean, the three centuries, the three last centuries have been the period in which science, engineering, and technology have played a more fundamental role in the history of humanity. And it looks like the best of ourselves leads us to disaster, to to suicide, how could it be? I would uh, like to say that even if it is not necessarily the usually the idea we have, I would say that the framing of science, energy, and uh, sorry, engineering and technology, uh, not all of that, but big part of that has been fundamentally driven by a worldview based on conflict on conflict with others, other humans, conflict between nations and conflict with nature. And it's, it's still pretty obvious in the way we have been framing the COVID thing, you know, the war on virus. The same mistake we made in the 70s when we were framing the war on cancer, as if conflict was the determining uh, feature of, uh, of life, you know. And uh, according to that, uh, the idea came that we are better than nature and others and other cultures just because we are able to destroy them, you know, to be more powerful than them. That's very much embedded in our uh, culture of today still. And this is something we have to look at uh, and, and change, of course, because we fancy with the idea that we can control nature and other cultures. We cannot, as again, the COVID shows the most basic piece of biological material is able to destabilize everything. So it's, uh, in my view, it's time for, uh, now that we are more and more aware of the consequences of the, 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 of the dominant framing of science engineering and technology, it's time for reframing it. Um, and that means, of course, a shift in epistemology pretty much along what Rodolfo has presented at the beginning of the, of the session, no con not considering complexity as the exception or as a bad thing, you know, oh, something is complex, we have to simplify it, but considering complexity as the foundation of, of life, actually. And uh, through this shift in epistemology, eliminate the blind spots we have and uh, start asking better questions. I want to put an example of um, policy officially approved policy which tries to do that, even if it can be overwhelmed by 
by the incumbent uh, worldview, but uh, the policy is uh, what is called in the context of the European institution, of the institutions of the European Union, responsible research and innovation, RRI. It has been approved as an official policy to, almost 10 years ago. And it integrates four ideas about what is uh, making research and innovation responsible. How do we do that? Four ideas which are reflect, so take a step backward, very much along cybernetics and second order cybernetics, you know, observe the observer and reflect on the frameworks we are using when we, when we do, when we practice science, innovation, technology. Include, include uh, everybody in the, in the process of what are the questions we are trying to answer with our science, with our technology, include all the people who will be benefit from that, but also the people who will be affected and be on that uh, nature and other living beings, respond, respond to the needs and to the values of uh, society and anticipate, anticipate the, the consequences of our actions. So uh, I think this gives a hopeful framework for that reframing, which is so much needed, which personally I translate into ideas like well-beings in biosphere, so balance our well-being with the biosphere, interdependencies, very much again along uh, Rodolfo's presentation, interdependency is the core of life, and uh, not isolation, communities, the role of communities and in communities in territories, let's go to look what are their questions and let's try to answer their questions and build the knowledge, the creation of knowledge from that, and, and I finish with that, mutual learning, because this is all about no way that uh, somebody, a genius somewhere, invents a silver bullet. It doesn't work that way. There are not problems and solutions. There are questions and answers which lead to new questions in an evolutionary process, which is always about mutual learning. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. I, th I think that... Um... Uh, I mean, we, we don't have to be surprised uh, for the, the current situation with all the, the, you know, the problems we have to face because they are just the byproduct of the scientific paradigm that you use in the past. And uh, that, that paradigm took away the human component out of the stage. So you see the, the consequences. And that's the, 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 real, the real point, you know. And, the, and, and, and now... We have to learn how to jump on the yellow on the on the yellow path, you know. Just uh, uh, continuous learning, and uh, and uh, is not time uh, of the uh, solitary genius that they have a nice idea or something like that. Is the time of uh, collective intelligence and collaborative innovation to put things at work for humanity in the right way, taking into consideration the human component, but. And uh, there is a little caveat and it is uh, never forget that humanity sometimes may, must, may be the, the worst enemy to man. <laughs> okay, so now I, I, I pass uh, uh, the stage to Toy, please, uh, if you like to, to uh, share with us uh, your ideas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me this, this morning. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting topic and it, and it warrants some um, a paradigm shift in the pr approach, if you will. Um, when we start to talk about, uh, you know, the, the transformational leadership role and how that impacts um, communities and, and, and the role of science and engineering and technology in these spaces, I think one of the first things we have to do, and you talk about we've removed the human component, we absolutely have. We need to dis demystify any part of this. Technology is just science brought to life. Engineering is a solution piece that most people use even though they don't realize they're using it. You know, uh, you, you, you assess something, you, you have a current state status, you have a desired state outcome, and we do what we must do in between to use data, even if we don't realize we're doing such, to make the best decision for the best outcomes. In communities that look like mine, 
so often the historical approach to uh, what is believed to be the solution for supporting um, uh, the human need, it, it eliminates us. We're not always at the table. And when we're absent from the table, the solution is not complete. In fact, it's lacking. It, the intent for um, what the uh, problem proposed, a need for solution, uh, the, the intent is lost when we don't include all of us that may be impacted by both the problem and the solution. We see it all the time. In, in some of the most human constructs, I'm from Detroit, Michigan in the United States. And with Flint, Michigan, there was such a, um, uh, an example when the decision was made to uh, change Flint's water repository, potable water repository from the clean uh, repository of the Detroit River to Flint's known to be tainted um, uh, repositories. And that decision was made to save some $6 million maybe a year. And, and the communities that would be affected were not the most affluent. They were usually the ones that were um, uh, already marginalized and already underrepresented. And women weren't at the table when those decisions weren't being made. And people that looked like the folks that would be impacted by the decision were not at the table when those decisions are being made. When we talk about COVID-19 and we see how it is of uh, um, its impact on communities that look like mine, and um, we recognize that though that its impact is is greater, not because the virus itself uh, attacks us differently, but because the disparities in our health systems and our health care has created gaps that made us most vulnerable to things like this. And that's where the global solution must come in. That's where um, a, a, an awareness and an honesty must take place uh, around who is not here, who is being um, 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 dismissed and, and overlooked in these spaces. And sometimes, sometimes the biases are, are conscious, but many times they're subconscious. They really just aren't. Um, I know through my own career, uh, I, I wrote, you know, all of my research in, in nuclear engineering was in nuclear medicine and oncology because I lost a grandmother to, to, to cancer. And I was really um, kind of perplexed that we could kill the cancer, but at the same time we would kill the patient because we're destroying the normal cells. And so my research was around a modality that would preserve the normal cell while killing the cancerous cell. And um, it was the dosimetry effects of double node microwave antenna in intraoperative radiation and intraoperative um, hyperthermia. Yet on my first day of work with a master's degree in nuclear engineering, I'm at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the question is, am I the new admin? Am I the new secretary? Nobody thought I might indeed be the actual nuclear engineer that was just hired. Those biases are subconscious because of a and I think it's global idea that one, women don't go into these fields and people that look like me are even less op, uh, um, um, often found in these fields. But nothing happens unless we are at the table. Nothing credibly, measurably, sustainably happens unless women are at the table. We tend to consider the whole person, the whole community, those that look like us, those that don't look like us. And so with disparities in health and disparities in education, uh, all of the gaps that exist between wealth and non-wealth, science and technology is the gap that is the gap closer. You know, we have an opportunity here to, to impact all communities with simple solutions, um, even if they are applied to complex um, um, questions and, 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 and a need to address complex problems. Um, we are a critical mass in this space, and we don't always use what we know to be true. When we started this conversation, and I'm listening to um, the discussions, I, I think sometimes we um, get into the space of science and we forget that if it wasn't for the human construct, there'd be no need for the science. And so I implore, uh, I, I, I impress upon all of us to recognize that the solution is not complete unless we're all at the table. 
the measurements are not taken and, and, and accurately applied unless we are really hearing the, we, we treat symptoms. We don't always treat the sore. We've got to get to the sore. And that's where my passion is in this place. I reach kids all over the globe. I go, you know, from Africa, all over the United States. And no matter where I find myself, there tends to be this underlying idea that the face of science and engineering and technology is white and male. And yet so many of the wonderful um, um, discoveries and inventions and innovations that have taken place in this field are not from white males. Um, interestingly enough, in this digital cell, cellular place that we're in, it was uh, Jesse Russell, black man, uh, who went to the Tennessee State, a historically black university and college in the United States, who worked for AT&T and, 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 and created this device or its application, its use that we all use today, but so many of us don't know about that. So we've got some communication to do, we've got some sharing to do, and we've got some um, demystifying to do in this space. And that's really where I'm thinking we can go and how we can create pipelines to take children from cradle all the way through you know, navigating their career choices by letting them know, first of all, you, you've been doing this all your lives. If you've been building sandcastles and uh, using Legos, you've been doing construction engineering <laughs> since you were a little thing. So we need to stop with this idea that it's the best and the brightest that come up with these ideas and therefore excluding those that might not identify themselves as the best and the brightest, because it's just not true. Absolutely. Thank you, Toy. Thank you, Toy. I agree completely with you. But again, I, I think that the major part of this situation is again the, the byproduct of the previous paradigm, you know, because uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the human component was completely out of the stage, uh, male and female uh, together, out of the stage. Yeah. And uh, that, that, that paradigm was created by one man, white. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and that's, so that's all the consequences is there. But now yeah. jumping on the yellow path, a new universe is open up, is opening up. And so yeah. then we have the space, the room for male and female. And I think that uh, we have to give more room to female component, but it's, uh, just to compensate from the past. Absolutely. To be, to be fair. Absolutely. Okay, thank, thank you so much for your contribution. You. So now I, I turn to, to Jonathan, please, uh, if you like to share with us uh, your ideas. Thank you. Um, so I just want to start by saying how nervous I've been actually in the last 24 hours to come to this session, uh, to be surrounded by hand-picked greatest minds to share ideas about collective intelligence and how we should move forward as uh, humans. And I have to say that I totally get why I was asked to be here uh, because of part of what Toei just shared and part of what uh, Michael and Carlos have had the chance to share as far as bringing people to the table and discussing the nuances of these problems. When I was born, uh, my father left and my mother raised me by herself for the first seven years of my life. And it was an interesting position to be in because my father was West Indian from Jamaica and my mom was about as mixed white as you can get, just a bunch of European things. And now she's got this mixed race son, multiracial son, growing up in a world uh, with the income that she can provide. And money wasn't a tool for us to solve problems and overcome obstacles and situate ourselves in this space. It was a barrier to participating with friends. It was a barrier to uh, having the right school supplies. And she absolutely did her best to make sure that I had the resources I needed to be the most successful because she saw the future in me. And I see the future in those that will come after me. When I was going to high school 
And I knew I wanted to go to MIT and I knew I wanted the research and I knew I wanted the collaborative space. I was working my butt off, but things still became barriers. Money was still a barrier. As I was going through my high school system, they were cutting my AP programs. And I was one of the handful of students who was in AP everything, AP Calc, AP Physics, AP, anything that I could get my hands on that I could get knowledge from yeah, so that yeah. I could learn, so that I could position myself to go to MIT to contribute in a meaningful way. And without those things, I don't even know if I would have had the opportunity, but not only did I have the opportunity, I went there and I learned about what being collaborative was actually like, what it meant to be at the table with a diverse group of people from all over the world who had their own unique experiences to share and their own ideas to add and really working together to solve problems. And that was flipped on its head for me when I went to medical school. And they said, do you know how the real world works? It works as a hierarchy. It's if you're at the top, you have the most say. We want you to collaborate and work with other people that are your peers, but your fellow isn't your peer, your attending isn't your peer. And not only that, the environment, it's gonna be hostile. Did you make a mistake in this learning environment? We're gonna tell you that you're a terrible person. Did you, you know, are you already constantly on edge because you're trying to study in the hours in between your massively uh, disproportionate work shifts? Uh, well, we're gonna remind you how people's lives are on the line, which you already know, but we're gonna remind you so that you have this sense of anxiety in every moment of every step that you're taking to do. By the way, if you have any suggestions about the ways that we should do things differently, improving with technology, improving with innovation, no way, because the people that are in charge like things that the way they are because they know how to do it. They don't have to learn anything new and they don't have to spend any time, effort, energy, money in figuring out how to incorporate those ideas at the table. And I've seen this everywhere I've gone. I went to China for about six months broken up into two separate parts in 2018, 2019. And while I was there, my primary goal was to help educate uh, Chinese students who wanted to go internationally for education because they've been told it's such a coveted thing. Come to the US and get an education, go to the UK, go to Australia, go to one of these predominantly white you know, areas where you'll get the best education you can ever have uh, and spend six figures every, every year you're doing it and your family is going to break the bank doing it and take out loans from corporations and do all these things to do it. And by the way, don't ask any questions. Don't challenge authority. Just listen to what you're being told and keep following these rules. And I went in there and I was a troublemaker. I was like, hell no, you got to speak up for what you know is right. You're going to have people that are more accredited than you, more you know, uh, educated than you, uh, telling you what to do all the time. And they are not always going to be right. And so the main thing I think that I can just remind people here while I have this platform is to stand up for what you believe in and actually meet the things you say. If you say collaborate, then mean it. There's a lot of buzzwords that people like to throw around. Oh, let's just collaborate and include and diversity and all these things. And then they just parade their tokens in front of everybody and say, here we are. Here we have diversity. Here we're inclusive. And they don't actually mean it. So make people show how they mean it. Transparency and accountability is the way forward. Being able to say, you actually have credible sources for the things that you're saying and you actually have data to back it up and science in and of itself is in a crisis a reproducibility crisis of key players with money saying here's this money make the science say the things we want to say and these conversations sometimes they're just outright in public and sometimes they're behind closed doors and even just making sure there's accountability at all levels for all people and transparency so that we collectively can see how how it is we are deciding to move forward is huge. Uh, I yield my time. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. Um, and uh, Patricia, now it's your turn, but you are the last to, to, to talk, but I think you are the, the luckiest one because uh, now you have a lot, a lot of material <laughs> to use for, <laughs> for your contribution. Please go. Uh, thank you so much, Rodolfo. Uh, you know, I want to I want to add on to what Michael, Carlos, Toy, and uh, our our last speaker uh, Jonathan has has added. 
Um, as Toy articulated, technology works best for those that create it, uh, and it can only directly impact those who have access to it. The other point that uh, I think we made was that technology evolves faster than we can create policies and laws that apply to it. As we see now, data is the is a universal currency, and we have lost the ability to keep it private, to uh, protect it, and that is something that is uh, going to have to be addressed in this new world order. I think the current COVID environment has peeled away the facade of equality and revealed deep-seated privileges and the fragility of those in positions of power and influence to maintain them and to overcome individual limitations and move into common well-being, we're forced to address some fundamental inequities in technology creation, access, application, and policy. Mm -hmm. It offers us the opportunity as a forcing function to address long-standing gaps by using our con collective intelligence, our voices united on the international stage to collaborate and innovate. Academic institutions, especially public ones, are facing a funding crisis based on outdated revenue models. Gone in the US are the glitz and glamor of campus life, stripped of, uh, of fancy athletic programs, facilities. How are institutions now going to be able to distinguish themselves? The ability of an institution to thrive in the new post-COVID-19 economy will be based on the quality of their pedagogy and research, their ability to draw students from wherever they are, deliver compelling and engaging content, to provide an online academic curriculum and research environment that is student rather than institution focused. But the question is, how will we make higher education accessible to everyone? And I've had the benefit of working with Carol Carter at the Global Minded Institute to widen my, my perspectives and, and increase my reach. I think that we have this new opportunity to change the way things have been done and to, and to push for the way things will work. And this, in, it, this requires a, a, a change. Many US academic institutions have relied on standardized test scores and now are switching to grade point averages as a primary consideration. But as we see from Toy's experience and from Jonathan's experience, what if we added a distance traveled metric, the distance between where a student started and where they can end up to measure student potential? What if we use the ability of an institution to advance these students as a measurement of the institution's success? The challenge that some of these is that some of these qualities are less obvious and we require more effort. Things that you've talked about on the yellow line, persistence, resilience, resourcefulness, empathy, but in the long run, it will produce the best graduates, uh, the graduates who can best address the challenges that we face in the 21st century. I also see a shift towards more of an interdisciplinary curriculum focused on problem solving with ethical considerations to develop the critical and ethical thinking skills our world needs. Problem solving does not require hard labs and can be designed to work interactively in small groups across geographies to build these collaboration, teamwork, and leadership skills. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Ann Gates, and her, and her colleagues at the University of Texas at El Paso have used this model very successfully to engage first-generation and underrepresented students who fall outside of the purview of a typical student studying science and technology. The current focus on grades as a sole measure of an individual is outdated. An individual achievement has been the overriding metric to date, but in the workplace, in the, the places where we, we do our, our most important work, the, the success of a team uh, is, involves the ability to work across a wide range of skills and interests. Each mm -hmm. team member has the opportunity and the responsibility to present a piece of work that grows their voice and leadership in their area of expertise. Mm -hmm. So without the ability to make technology accessible to everyone, the gap between the haves and have nots will continue to widen. And in order to support the UN Sustainable Development Goals for quality education, industry, innovation, and infrastructure, reduced inequalities, and peace, justice, and strong institutions, we need to reinvent and reinvest in our educational systems by making technology accessible to all, taking advantage of this current crisis to address centuries of inequality and in injustice. 
a new model of learning will threaten those who want to maintain the status quo, as Jonathan uh, outlined, but change is inevitable. We must recognize that fear, intolerance, injustice, and apathy are the enemy, not change, not different ideas, languages, races, or ideologies. We need to create a place for leaders who can change the world. We will need to change the way we educate them. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, I think that we have to remember that, that, that education is a, 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 a political construction. You know, I mean, a, a public education is a political construction. And a, a, any education is based on, a, on a, a set of pedagogies, and each pedagogy is based on values. And those values were chosen uh, by the old paradigm. <laughs> and so that's, that's the chain that we have, we have to, to follow to, you know, just to, to let a politician understand that it is uh, their interest to jump on the yellow path because they can have more in that way than, than, the, than stay, try to stay, in, you know, stay on the red path, you know? And so uh, we have to move in that direction. You're absolutely correct, if I could jump in there. You're absolutely correct, because um, in the United States, and this may be true everywhere, um, the idea of an education created a exclusive, privileged group. Um, and so, you know, on a system that was built on free labor, um, it was more, advantage, more advantageous to um, keep uh, your, your, your labor market heavily populated versus, let's say, your higher education market. My brother and I are fortunate that we are fourth generation college. You know, my great grandmother's sister went to college. My grandparents went to college and had master's degrees. My mother was an educator 35 years in public education. My father, a uh, engineer. And so with that, there was always a model for what success looks like, and yet at the same time, a uh, responsibility to embrace and understand that there was value and honor in all levels of honorable work, hard work. So we worked hard in those spaces. But the idea that we now are seeing here is that students are being told that they should choose between a non-collegiate track uh, where, you know, this idea of enormous debt is acquired in that space or, um, you know, going to college. And so I don't think kids should have to choose. I don't think young people should have to choose. I think um, you should be able to take advantage in your high school years of a uh, dual degree program. You should be taking classes at the community college and trying to understand, you know, what it is and where you fit in and where's your contribution going to come with respect to um, the, the world. You know, you are part of a global society. This idea that we're these small and siloed groups of people is ridiculous. Um, and no matter how much we might try to um, uh, uh, pacify and support that, that old mentality, it's not going to happen. It's not going to work. Um, America is browning rapidly, and there's nothing that we'll be able to do to stop it. But it's a beautiful thing. We're a gumbo pot. The world is a gumbo pot, and we should embrace all of that. There are those who have great skills with their hands and historically um, and traditionally continue in that space. And then there are those who are these incredible dreamers, and they should be encouraged to dream. And we should remove the roadblocks to allow that genius to come through. Um, I think one of the biggest things, the challenges that we have in this science and, and, and engineering and technology space is allowing ourselves to um, uh, actually, you know, recognize and identify the engineering genius and the dreaming genius in those who have not gone to formal, you know, been through the formal education system. You know, do you really? Yeah. You, know, you, you understand what I'm saying? And so oh, yes, no, no, but uh, yes. it's, it's, it's not ridiculous. It's just a, a completely waste of human, resor of human resources. Mm -hmm. And that's not good for our planet. <laughs> Absolutely. We waste mm -hmm. uh, all our resources in, 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 in a strange way. And, uh, and uh, think about even uh, uh, the, uh, there is a, a nice book from Mary Catherine Bateson. On, mm -hmm. on active wisdom, active wisdom uh, that focuses on, on retired people that are retired, but, but not tired. <laughs> and, so, and so 
look at that. One more There's waste, you know. Money around that. Fortran 77 was the language when I was coming yeah. through. It's been retired, right? But because yeah. some of the older government systems are still based on that language, they've had to go pull from those retired engineers who were in computer scientists because nobody knows the language anymore. And those old dudes are making money too. Because, <laughs> <you know? laughs> okay, okay. Uh, Carlos, uh, anybody likes to just to add something because... Uh, we have uh, only five minutes left for our session. Uh, maybe we can add a, a few minutes more if, uh, if we, uh, I mean, I like to hear from uh, each one of you, but just a, a short, short, uh, a short one, please. Carlos, you, st you like to start? Unmute, unmute yourself, please. No, no, unmute, unmute yourself. Can't hear you. Now, I was, okay. I was kicking, I was kicking two times. Yeah, yeah. So very, I mean, very exciting. Uh, what I've been hearing from the from the other panelists, and uh, there is a cultural revolution to achieve here. Um, a new civilization. <laughs> Yes, a new civilization. That's what we say in the club. I mean, I, I really think it's about taking, making different civilizational choices than we made in the past and that we imposed in the past to others. We, I mean, the Western, uh, what we call the Western civilization in the, in the three last uh, centuries. So, and I'm especially hopeful that we find a way to change the model of, as I said before, of knowledge creation. You know, because I loved what was said about uh, uh, everybody has the capacity. So we, we also have to transform education, as we said this, this morning, you know, um, along that idea that uh, kids have 100 languages and we still 99 of them. So, uh, our educational systems are are working as as uh, limiting system as a censoring uh, system. If we were able to to work from that, you know, from that perspective, that everybody has unique capacities, and then everybody is entitled to to participate in the decisions and to and and to be part of the decisions of what questions are addressed through whatever means, scientific, technological, uh, economic, and cultural means, uh, that would look quite, uh, quite differently. This is a cultural revolution. I think we have to make it to be clever because we know that we cannot change complex systems in a purposeful way. That's one of the lessons we learn about complexity we are anxious about, we recognize complexity and the second later, we want to have a linear uh, pathway to solution. Well, no. It's, Let's I mean, create the conditions for the, yeah, in an indirect I, way for that invisible revolution to happen. Yeah, I, li I like to think about an evolution rather than a revolution, you know, because uh, a, a, an evolution that uh, is taking into account uh, all the past uh, mistakes, uh, all, all the the things that we have to still learn, and then uh, building building on that in a in an active way, uh, just uh, uh, taking account of all the resources that we have. That uh, I mean, uh, you know, that just uh, avoiding any waste and uh, learning from uh, a circular economy that uh, is important to respect nature first first of all, because we we need to uh, to preserve this planet for all our children and the children of our children. And that's it. So I think that our time is over. And, uh, but uh, I like to, to hear uh, just a few words from Michael, if, uh, if you like. Yes, um, we build these great technologies, but we don't think about who the user is or at what cost. We have these great universities, but who can afford to go? People of color, poor people, people internationally cannot attend. 
we build these great medical treatments. Who can afford them? Uh, chemo kills, there's, sub, there's consequences. We have COVID-19. We have where people over 65 who have unlike medical system, we build ventilators for them, but 97% of them die on ventilators. You know, so we got to think if we have the technologies, people's perception of what they need is different. Our perception is engineering when you build them. We got to think of who we build these tools for and make it accessible to everybody. Yep. Yep. And uh, anybody likes to add this, uh, anything? I mean, uh, Patricia? No? You're just, satisfied uh, with, with it. You're Jonathan, what about you? I just have one thing to add, because um, I know that the focus of the um, entire conference is to kind of get the answers for the solutions moving forward. And, you know, how do we begin to have the, what are the steps we need to take for this evolution, as you put it, Rodolfo. And I think that one of the things we have to make sure the message kind of reaches the top to where the people are still kind of entrenched in money and powers, just to tell them to listen. There are a lot of groups, there are a lot of people speaking up for the things that they need, uh, the elderly, the young, the, the veterans, uh, people everywhere speaking up for the things that they need. And at this point, it's kind of time to bring them to the table and listen. Yep. Uh, I, I have here a, a, a question from, from the audience that is, is asking, it is true that higher education should not be a choice for the children of society. However, I do feel like the choice itself is a privilege of sorts, which is unfair. A student who can afford to take a test such as the SAT or GMAT, etc., has the privilege of having the opportunity to make the choice. I feel the issue is much deeper than people merely choosing. How can that be tackled? But uh, I think that we already, already answered to this question with uh, our, our uh, you know, contribution because uh, uh, we arrive to the conclusion that, uh, you know, we cannot play with the, this, this reference frame any longer. We have just to start uh, moving uh, and, uh, uh, and put uh, our idea, idea into action uh, to just to uh, let uh, politicians uh, understand better that there is uh, for their main interest changing the status quo. Do you agree? Well, I do. And, and for that question, many universities are no longer using SATs and GMATs um, as a discriminator or a, you know, uh, in, in, in terms of selection, especially after we've been made aware of um, some of the scandals behind those. And so um, at the end of the day, I guess what I would like to say is money, it, it is necessary, it is needed, but it should not be the reason why a student should not pursue higher education. In our country, in USA, there's about $49 billion worth of grant and scholarship money that's made available, and about $10 billion of that goes untapped and returned every year. So, you know, we have to help our, our students understand that looking for grant money is like looking for a job. It can be a, you know, eight hour a weekend type of a thing. Um, but there are ways and there are opportunities that are open. We need to make the information accessible to them just as we do the funding. And we need, they, they take out a loan for a car, they take out a loan for a house. If you have to take out a loan for your education, take out the loan for the education. Because if you don't pay it back, unlike the car and the house, nobody's going to repossess it. <laughs> 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 Excellent. <laughs> Perfect. This, I think that this is the, the, the right conclusion of this panel. Right yeah, now. yeah, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Toy. Thank you to everybody because uh, your contrib your contribution was so so wonderful, so, uh, so fundamental. We unfortunately uh, we had a little time to touch all the issues, but uh, I think that uh, we just selected the most important ones, and and we able we were able to build in a, 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 a nice uh, discussion. Uh, thank you for your participation, and uh, and see you uh, 